Welcome back. We're going to go ahead and take our seats and get started with our next talk. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and get our seats. So it's really, truly a pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, this is Dr. Neil Cook, and he's the president of the European Association of Neuroscience Nursing, and it, it is just such a pleasure to have him here today. He's also the associate head of school, reader, uh, school of nursing in Ulster University. And, um, and he's an executive board member on the British Association of Neuroscience Nurses. Uh, Dr. Cook's extensive published work includes research articles, book chapters, and a commissioned report. And just another plug for the European Association of Neuroscience Nursing meeting, that will be in Manchester in March. There is still time to get in your abstract and plan to join us in uh, Manchester. And so join me in welcoming Dr. Neil Cook. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here. It's so nice uh, to be invited to speak uh, and, to, and to meet with you all. Um, so, so thank you. And um, I'm going to have a, a bit of a talk around the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is something that you will all be very familiar with, um, and some research that we have done um, as part of the European Association of Neuroscience Nurses and the British Association. But we had great support and involvement with WFNN as well in, in, in doing this um, study. So I've started with um, my opening slide just to give you a little bit of information about me other than my, my clinical or academic background. As I come from Ireland, so um, I come from the Republic of Ireland, but I work and live in Northern Ireland. So you can see the, uh, the monument there on the, on the screen. Um, that's maybe a couple of miles from my house. Um, so uh, a very um, ancient monument. It was built um, in the sixth century. So. Um, um, just to give you a little flavour about where I've come from, to come over here and to see your, even your history. I walked down from the hotel this morning, um, uh, some beautiful parts of your city and old, old buildings and culture as well. But anyway, I, I digress a little bit, but if you ever want to come to Ireland, it's very close to Manchester, a uh, short flight. Um, so if you do come to um, the, the Congress in Manchester, um, there's lots of great places to see, very, very um, easily ac accessed from Manchester. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm, I'm going to talk about the Glasgow Coma Scale, but it's really to think about how much we know and how much we think we know about the Glasgow Coma Scale. So it's something that as neuroscience nurses we should know really well and we use every day, but how much we think we really know um, might surprise you when, when you see some of the results of, of the study. And so and considering that then, what are the areas of contention and confusion? Considering that the, the GCS has been around for so long, it should really be something that we're very familiar with, that there shouldn't be any contention or confusion around. Um, I'm going to present some of our research findings which shows a lot of that confusion that's there and then think about, well, what's the way forward here? Um, and that always has the potential to include everybody in the room about how, how we take that forward. So some of this should be really well known to you all. The GCS was developed in 1974 by uh, Janet Teasdale. Uh, so it's long established, it's very universally accepted as the, the measurement tool for consciousness, level of consciousness. It's considered an objective um, scale to assess, to quantify, communicate someone's level of consciousness. Um, and it was initially only developed as an audit tool, so it was never designed to be used the way we use it today. It was really designed initially um, as an audit tool, and then, it, and then it obviously took hold. So it's there to help us um, get accurate assessment, to monitor, um, and it's now been used on other scales like the Apache 2, it forms a component of those. Um, and we know from a lot of extensive evidence that as the score drops, the, the mortality increases. Uh, and we know that the motor component is probably the most important part in terms of its sensitivity um, to, to show um, deterioration, neurological deterioration. Yet that's probably the component where people are, are least accurate in, in assessing so when you think about that history, and it's been over 40 years um, in existence and in use, it really is surprising why is there still confusion around the scale and its use. So if we look at some of the evidence um, very quickly, and there's a lot of evidence, um, myself and Dr. Mary Brain from um, Salford University have a, a paper published in 2016 on this where we look at all the evidence. 
um, and it'll surprise you actually how much of the guidelines that are out there around its use are not actually derived from evidence. Um, they are derived from what people thought would be best practice rather than being evidence informed. So we know in studies, um, for example in 2006, that students in particular lack confidence, 62%. So we think most of, of people who come out and work going to neurosciences quite often have very little experience in neurosciences. So what are we doing in education that prepares people to do neurological assessment accurately? And we know that experience and knowledge will increase confidence, um, um, but, but we can't always have every single person who's assessing GCS be that experienced person, so the knowledge element has to be right. Um, and we know that they also inform accuracy um, from some recent studies, we know that 56% of nurses um, rated themselves of having very poor knowledge of GCS, and 42% said that it's satisfactory, and only 3% had good knowledge. Um, so that kind of worries me a little bit. We know from other studies very early on, uh, when the scale was relatively new, that there was high inter uh, rate of reliability between medical staff and nursing staff. And that's probably because when something is new, it gets a lot of attention, it gets a lot of input, it's a new scale, everybody gets trained up, etc. And, and everyone's singing off the same hymn sheet, but over time that can change. We know that um, the older you are and the more educated you are, then the reliability um, increases. Um, and that would obviously then follow on that reliability can be affected by the training and the consistency of that training. And we know that if we use things like vignettes, etc., and, and trying to educate people, that that um, leads to improved accuracy as well. But not everywhere is doing that. Um, and the, the amount of, I suppose, education that's out there around it is still very debatable. So just looking at one of the more recent studies um, by Reith et al., um, they looked at nurses and physicians and, uh, and other healthcare professionals. And without going into that graph in too much detail, you can see on the graph that actually how we even report, never mind do the GCS, but even report it, is all over the place. So some people will um, report it in words, some people give a composite score, some give a breakdown score. Um, and that varies across professions, it varies within professions. So even without the accuracy of how we do it, we don't even have cons um, consistency and, and um, you know, a standard of how we actually should report it. Um, and then there's a very big significant difference in terms of how each healthcare professional actually assesses um, in terms of painful stimuli, which is what I'm going to focus on today. So for example, you'll see 67% of, of nurses will use nail bed pressure um, and, you know, uh, that's very different to maybe what you'll see, like neurosurgeons, 60% of them will use sternal rub, according to this study. So um, it varies significantly, and then there's also the, the contentious debate about which of these is the best approach, and which of them is the safest approach, and which of them does the least harm, but it still gives you the best assessment. And that's really, really important for us, particularly as nurses, and if you think of whatever your codes of practice are in any country in the world, you know, one of the things we don't want to do is do harm to people. And when you're applying a painful stimulus to somebody, you want to minimize the amount of times you're going to do that. And you want to do that in, in the, the least harmful way. So we know then in terms of painful stimuli that there are two components of the GCS um, that require um, us to, do, to apply painful stimulus. So it's eye-opening response and the motor response. And you'll see some other findings as, uh, when I present them, that actually some people and quite a lot of people use it also to assess verbal response even though it's not even on the scale. Um, what areas of confusion seem to be around, and it was very interesting when we did the survey, how many people actually stopped at the question around central versus um, peripheral stimulus. Um, if I asked you in the room how many people know the difference between the application of a a peripheral or a central stimulus and whether, which one you should use for eye-opening motor response, how many people would feel confident to put their hand up and say, yeah, I do? Okay. One, two people? Three? Four? Okay, we found when we looked at this, and actually the people who are not putting their hand up don't feel bad. Actually, when we looked at the, the, the survey results, I think most people did not know really the difference between the two. Some people had very clear views on when you should use one and should use the other. And when you look at the pathophysiology and the physiological processes involved, actually it really makes no difference. It's whether it's stimulating a, a central 
um, central nervous system or higher central nervous system uh, processing, whether it's applied peripherally or applied centrally, is, is actually irre irrelevant. Um, but we'll, we'll come to that. So, um, how long to apply the painful stimulus was the other one that people had really significant confusion about. Um, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll come to some of the results. So, um, we know that the nociceptive pathways that, you know, for, for an impulse to travel takes around 6 to 30 milliseconds. Now, to find that information, I say it took Mary and myself a very long time going through physiology journals, etc., etc. So, when you think about it, nowhere in any of the GCS publications and over its 40 years of, of being published, does it actually base the assessment and, and the guidance around some of those physiologies. So when you think about how long it takes for, for you know, that nervous impulse to travel, why are we applying painful stimuli for some people over 30 seconds? It might take, you, it might take the person a, a longer time to react to that, but actually if the painful stimulus has been sent to the central nervous system, to the brain, to be processed, that might take a longer time to react, and it doesn't mean we need to apply the painful stimulus for that length of time. So, um, but nowhere again is the, are, are any of the guidelines based on, 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 the, on the evidence for that. Um, a peripheral stimulus that only results in the spinal reflex will not stimulate a central response. So there's all that debate around a peripheral stimulus, but it may generate a spinal reflex, but it also may um, travel on up uh, to the brain for processing as well. So it's about being clear what's a reflex response and what's a painful stimulus and how can we avoid triggering, triggering a reflex response. So um, when we look at it, just to give you, I suppose, a quick look um, at the pathways and both, both of those um, pathways that you can see on the left and the right of the image there, one's a centrally uh, applied painful stimulus, which usually comes through the some branch of the trigeminal nerve um, and is relayed up um, to the primary somatosensory cortex and the other one starts peripherally um, in a first order neuron and is relayed up to the primary um, somatosensory cortex. So actually whether you've applied it peripherally or centrally really makes no difference as long as it's getting processed centrally. Does that make sense? Yet there's huge confusion about when you should use a peripheral stimulus, when you should use a central one. And the, some of those, really the answer to that is quite practicality reasons. For example, if you use a, a trapezius pinch or grip, that's more likely to make somebody grimace, so it's not very good for looking at eye opening response. But it's not because it's better at getting to the somatosensory cortex than any other, uh, or worse. Does that make sense? Okay. So, I've kind of maybe mentioned most of these as, as we've gone along. So, it's, the, the argument, first of all, is, is you know, where's the confusion? It's around the ease of use. Actually, when you look at the results of this study, and when you really delve down into people's knowledge around it, it isn't all that easy. Um, do we sum the score, or do we give the breakdown of the score and report the total score? Um, that understanding, as I said, between peripheral and central. Um, when we use it in terms of people that are going into disorders of consciousness, people who are sedated, you know, what are we really assessing here if we've sedated somebody and we're now trying to assess arousability and awareness, but we've sedated them? It's kind of contradictory. Um, so why are we doing that? Unless we're trying to measure the effectiveness of sedation, which is not really what we use the GCS for. Are we using it to guide outcomes and, and interventions? And quite often we are, so that makes it really important that we do it accurately. How long do we apply the stimulus? Where do we apply it? And when do we apply it? So our study was looking really a lot of this. So we looked at did an extensive literature review, um, which I've given, given you some of the, the key points from. And then we want to look at well, what do neuroscience nurses really know about the GCS then and painful stimuli? And part of this came around from actually a, when the relaunch of the GCS occurred in 2014. Um, Professor Graham Teasdale, who was the, one of the original people who developed it, came to the, the British Association of Neuroscience Nurses Congress to launch the standards, and in the video, and you'll see it if you look at the, I think it's glasgowcomascale.org, the website for the relaunch um, in 2014, there's a video and they talk about applying nail bed pressure, and we had a conversation with him about why he's talking about applying nail bed pressure, and you know, our experiences of, of um, it being, first of all, a way that nails get damaged and bruised, and there are alternative ways of doing this, and he said, well, there's no evidence. There's no evidence of any of that, it's all anecdotal. So we said, well, we'll get the evidence. So that's what we've done. So actually, nobody in the 40 years thought about 
looking at what are the complications of these painful stimuli. So we wanted to see what nurses knew, but also what was their experiences. So what did they find in terms of, of these complications? And then to try and use that to develop some best practice guidelines. Um, it was a mixed method approach. We had a 25 item um, um, questionnaire because there was no tools that there existed. So nobody looked at people's knowledge or the complications of GCS in over the 40 years that it existed. Um, and then we used an online um, tool then Qualtrics to, to uh, assess that and we were able to then actually get responses from all over the world and we had um, ethical approval across uh, three universities and um, two um, regional um, governance and ethics groups in the UK as well. So we had, and this is to me quite interesting, maybe not interesting to everybody, but we had 793 people who accessed the study um, and 558 consented to it, um, but only 273 fully completed the survey. And actually, when they got to the questions around peripheral and central and what they understood by it, people stopped. And to me, that's data in itself, because people said, oh my God, I can't answer this, um, and I don't know. And that's really, really important, because that just tells you people actually felt they, they couldn't continue. They stopped right at those points, and that's what we were looking to assess, but actually it would have been great if they were able to continue, but that in itself said actually this is beyond my knowledge or beyond my ability, I, I, I can't answer this. And we actually had some people who emailed us directly um, to say, you know, I've stopped at this point because actually I, I've just realised I don't know and I'm going back to look it up um, and I think if I do that I'm not going to give you an accurate response to, to your survey. Um, most people worked in adults, so in, in the UK we, we, we have adult nurses, children's nurses, um, mental health nurses, and then people that work with people with intellectual disabilities, so that's not the same everywhere, but that was the breakdown, and as you would expect, the breakdown is, um, you know, majority of female um, respondents because of, of the ratios in the profession. You can see on that graph, just the very bottom line is the, the, is the UK participants, so there was a huge um, response from the UK. Um, Australia, Denmark, Poland and the US would have been um, the next and, and Italy um, in terms of percentage response. And I think again it's a study we probably need to repeat and it will be a great study to even do in Canada and to do in the US to try and complement and follow this up. You have such big numbers of neuroscience nurses compared to some of the European countries where they don't recognise specialities in the same way that we could actually build a much better um, uh, knowledge base around this um, to help inform guidelines and best practice. So um, in terms of the amount of education that people had, um, that should be 25% it says in value where it says red, but 25% um, of people said they had never had any neuroscience focused education either before their registration as a nurse or after, even though they're all worked, everybody who responded to the survey worked in a neuroscience setting. So that to me first of all is a major issue because we can't expect people to have specialist knowledge and skills if we don't educate them in those. And so that was, you know, uh, very important. And then if you look at the next levels of, of um, education there, really it comes down to in-service study days, inductions, courses, conferences. They were the major routes of education for neuroscience nurses. So again, globally, there's obviously an issue here. We're not providing neuroscience nurses with, um, you know, really well-built programs that lead to career progressions, etc., etc. So there, there's, there's an issue there that we need, we need to look at. Um, we had, when we looked at then as well, we had quite a lot of people who had over, more than 10 years experience. Now when you consider that, and you consider that still 25% of nurses had no education, some people have been working there for, t for more than 10 years and still had, had no education in neurosciences and there's only a small 11% uh, were working there for less than two years. So people who are, basically most of the people you're talking about there, 89% have been working for more than two years in neurosciences and 25% and had none, no education. So when we asked people then about how long they would apply a painful stimulus, most people were less than six seconds, but you can see there that over half, um, or roughly half, were greater than six seconds, and even some are going over more than 30 seconds. So again, we think back to first do no harm and the distress the pain can cause. Why are we doing that? Um, we asked when people were determining eye-opening response, what was the most common method to use? Um, trapezius pinch was the most common, yet it's the one that's most likely to cause people to grimace. And so 
if they grimace, they tend to close their eyes, so not the greatest way to do it. Um, and the next most common was supraorbital pressure, which is the one which I'm going to show you later on, is the one that probably has the most risks associated with it, uh, particularly in, in trauma patients. The rationale for why they chose that stimulus to assess that component of the GCS was very interesting. Um, so 22% said yes, it's the most reliable and the most effective method. 25% um, almost said, well, it's because that's the way I was taught. So it's not really a questioning and evidence rationale, so that's the way I was told to do it. Or another 20% is what the guidelines tell me to do. Um, so, and then nearly 5% of people said, well, it's the easiest method. So it wasn't about what was best for the person or the most evidence informed. Well, it's the one I think is easiest to do. Um, other people did strange things like touch and tickle and shout at people, which are not painful stimuli. Um, some people did two methods at the same time, which um, really was confused me. Um, when we asked if there was no response what they would do, thankfully a lot of people, nearly half, said that they would record what they observed, and that's my response. Um, but quite a lot of people, well, nearly the rest, went on to actually apply another painful stimulus of a different type just to check. So they either doubted their response or they wanted to confirm their response. And again, we have to think, well, if you were confident in how you were doing the first one and accurate in how you are doing the first one, why apply a second painful stimulus to a person? Um, and you have to think, why is that acceptable and why do people feel that's acceptable? Um, some people said they would just try the same one again. Some people said they would get a second opinion, so they really didn't feel they trusted themselves. And one person said they would do endotracheal suction. I do not know why, but <laughs> there we go. Again, um, coming back to it, a lot of people said it's because of what policy told me or what I was taught to do. Um, and some people thought it was a stronger stimulus, which I don't understand either. But that's, it's interesting to know that because that's what we're telling people when we teach them, or that's what we're telling people in practice when we're role modeling what we're doing. When determining the motor response, then um, again, trapezius pins come out on top, um, and again, followed by supraorbital pressure. Um, and it's interesting because when I started working in, in neurosurgery and critical care, we were told never to do supraorbital pressure because of the risks associated with it. So this, this really surprised me. Um, but again, it's, they're still coming out there as, as, the, as the two highest um, uh, methods. Again, other methods would be pinching their thigh, shouting at them. Stimulate them toes or asking them to obey commands, none of which are a painful stimulus. Um, similar rationales for eye opening response. Largely, it's because people were told this is how to do it, this is how it was taught, or it was easy. And again, if no response, again, very similar res um, response. Other people said they would um, do a pen rub to the sole of the foot, tickle the sole of the foot, or they would increase the duration of the stimulus. Which again, when you think back to how long it takes to send that stimulus, and trigger that, that painful reaction. It might take longer for that person to respond, but actually it doesn't take any longer for it to get that. Either the, the, the nociceptive pathway is intact or it's not. Okay. So when we ask which, which component do you assess first, um, so we can see most people assess both eye opening um, and motor response at the same time. Um, and you could argue whether that's best practice or not. Um, the next highest percentage was assess eye-opening first, and the rationale for that for most people was, well, that's the order it comes in the scale, so you can kind of understand that. And only a small response or, or percentage went with motor response first. And I've, I've really just kind of talked you th through those results. So this was interesting. So we can see here that nearly 30% of people um, apply a central painful stimulus for a verbal response, and 20% by a peripheral painful stimulus for a verbal response. And my overwhelming question was, why? That's not even part of verbal response. It's got nothing to do, you know, it's orientation, confusion, and appropriate words. But yet, nearly a third, you know, nearly 28%, nearly, you know, over a quarter of people are applying pain to people to see what their verbal response will be. <laughs> I know what my response would be if I was the patient. Um, and then another percentage of people were doing it for reasons that were totally unrelated to the GCS at all. I mean, some people were applying a peripheral, painful um, peripheral um, stimulus, 13%, just 
it seemed to me, to me for no reason, that there was no rationale behind it. So that was quite worrying about why we're doing that. But so people had various um, views about whether they should, uh, this stimulus should be central or peripheral for um, uh, eye opening and, and motor. So most people were going for central stimulus for eye opening. Um, and um, again, also most people for motor response is central stimulus. But actually, as we said earlier on, it really doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, the reasons, um, the other reasons um, that people were doing it, um, some people said, don't know. And actually, I liked that those people said, I don't know. And it would have been better if more people had said, I really don't under understand why I'm doing it, so I'm quite happy to say, I don't know. That's refreshing, because that means we have to address that through education. Now, in terms of the complications that we came across, so this is the evidence that Graham Teasdale was telling us doesn't exist um, around um, the complications. So for trapezius pinch, the most observed um, complication um, was uh, bruising, so what you would maybe expect, and nearly 25% of people um, found that. Ones that I found kind of very worrying was 3.2% reported hematoma formation. So you have to think how much pressure was they applying to cause hemorrhage to form a hematoma. Um, now there could have been some other medical reason behind that. Maybe the person had DIC or some other clotting disorder, etc. Um, but then that should also have been factored into your decision about whether trapezius pinch is the best way to do that. Um, and again, you know, 3.2% reported fingernail marks. In terms of pressure to the side of the finger, there was um, slightly less um, um, in terms of uh, complications observed. Um, again, bruising was the biggest one, but again, pressure to the side of the finger and hematoma formation, again, surprised me, 1.7%. So it's not a huge percentage, but I think, really, should that occur at all? I've never seen it in all the times I've done it. Nail bed pressure, 41.5% of nurses observed complications. So this is the one that we actually asked Professor Teasdale about. He said, why are you advocating this? In our experience, this is problematic. Um, so bruised nail bed, nearly 78% um, of people. But you know, blackened nail, damaged nail, loss of fingernail, sensory loss, for all those things to be reported. You know, even in small numbers, when there are alternative methods, of applying painful stimuli, we need to really think about what we're doing. Fingertip pressure, which is really what um, is advocated in the written guidelines, even in the relaunch, even though the nail bed pressure is what's on the, on the website. Again, um, a lot less complications, um, but, and also when you look at the evidence around where the most um, sensitive areas are for, for applying painful stimuli, the fingertip is actually more sensitive. Um, and the second most um, sensitive place, apparently, in terms of density of sensory neurons is the forehead. Um, but so a lot less observations, and yet probably the most uh, um, sensitive area to be using. Sternal rub, 60% of complications. So the mo most commonly used by neurosurgeons. Um, and you can see bruising, 87.3% of, of the complications. But rib fractures, fracture displacement, both of those could be life-threatening. Okay, so this is where we have to really think about what we're doing. So some of those other ones are complications we really don't want to have or to cause, but we really don't want to get into the area of causing life-threatening complications like rib fractures, fracture displacement. That's pretty significant. Okay. Superorbital pressure, again, um, even though we're so cautiously warned about it, 12.5% um, um, observation of complications. But some of these were, again, life-threatening. So fracture displacement, which can cause a penetrating brain injury. Not the greatest thing you want to have on your record. Um, eye injury, 11% of the complications. Raised intracranial pressure, and nearly 3% of complications. Again, counterintuitive to what we're doing. And periorbital bruising, 70% of those complications. So again, that means we're causing quite a bit of trauma. Is there an alternative we can use? So when we ask then the nurses about um, their concerns about using the GCS and applying a painful stimulus and asked how many had concerns, 55% said they had concerns, which I was glad to hear because you could see it through the results that there were clearly issues. Um, and um, the most significant concerns they had were they were causing distress or harm to a person 
So we all come into nursing not to cause distress or harm to somebody, and it feels very counterintuitive to apply a painful stimulus to somebody um, and, and do something that feels harmful. And so uh, despite any years of experience, that still was the most um, um, common um, concern that people had. Um, they felt it was counterintuitive to their, their to caring, to caring and compassion. And some people wrote paragraphs in the response about how much distress it caused them every day. And it made me think, as an educator and as a nurse, how much do we actually even deal with that component when we're teaching people about the GCS, that we teach people, you're going to do something that's counterintuitive, and how do we help people actually come to terms with doing that and the reason for doing that, and how best then to choose what they're doing. Um, quite a lot of nurses said they were really worried about the distress it caused to family. So when family came in and saw them applying a painful stimulus and, the, and the, the person's reaction to it, how bad they felt and how distressed the family were and how difficult it was to explain to the family why they were doing this and causing the stress, particularly when they were doing it very frequently um, and, and how to manage that. And again, I don't know any education program that really deals with how we deal with that element of it. Um, a huge amount of people say, well, I don't know how much pressure to apply. And again, when you see the amount of complications observed, you can understand where that comes from. Um, again, nearly everybody that recorded concerns said, why are there no, no clear guidance? Why is there no universal policy, process, everything that we all follow, that we all know we should follow, that's very explicit and clear, this is what we do, and this is how we respond if this happens, etc., etc." Why is that after 40 years not there? Because, again, in the literature review that Mary and I did, um, you could see there was vast disparity. And again, it was not always evidence informed. Um, obviously, then people said there was a lack of evidence informed education. So a lot of people said, I was never taught how to do this. Um, and there was inconsistencies between what the nurses were told and how, how to do it, and then the medical profession in particular. So when people come in, they say, well, how come? then I get in trouble if I do it this way and a doctor tells me I should do it this way, but the nursing guideline says do it this way. That came up very frequently too. So we're supposed to be working very interprofessionally and again, um, there was an issue there. So um, there's a clear need for explicit guidelines and standardised education. And I think I said 25% at no education earlier on. It's actually 34.5. The previous research that uh, Mary and I did to look at neuroscience nurses education through the EAN showed 25% had no education. This had a much bigger response. We we'll actually see there's a lot, it's a lot higher than that. Um, we know that there's witnessed harm. Sternal rub seems to have the most amount of complications, um, but some other complications from some of the other methods, including sternal rub, um, could be life-threatening. Nurses generally don't want to cause distress or, or apply pain to people. There's no consensus there uh, on the way forward. There's a lack of consistency in guidelines. So these are all things we need to address. And there's the need for that clarity around central versus peripheral. And so hopefully I've helped a little bit with that earlier on. And then we need to reinforce the score, what you see, not what you think you should see or what you think you should anticipate. So it's about this is the